G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder. Today, we're going to be having a look at the F2G1 Super Corsair, which is the Battle Pass reward for the free tier of War Thunder's first season of its Battle Pass. Now, in this particular case, I think the F2G1 is a real win-win situation for everyone. The plane itself is fairly well balanced, it's a premium, it's a coupon, and at the same time it's also free. Now, the way you unlock it, of course, is through the Battle Pass, uh, and you basically have to get to level 50. Now, for me, uh, getting to level 50 was a piece of cake. I managed to do it uh, fairly quickly, so we're less than halfway through the Battle Pass, and I've already got to uh, a fairly high tier of the uh, of the Battle Pass. And another 25, I'm going to be unlocking the T10A uh, permanently, or at least as a coupon, uh, and so that will give me access to that particular coupon. Of course, I paid for the Battle Pass, and... Uh, I managed to get the Hedgehog and the Garland as well. So if you want this particular plane, you do have to work uh, reasonably hard. You don't have to, you know, sweat for it as such. You just have to sort of apply yourself over the period of about a month uh, and you can get yourself this particular plane. Now, I've also done it alongside other things like Operation Winter and the little Christmas things, uh, as well as, of course, specifically targeting the Battle Pass and the Warbond Shop. Now, that's enough of the uh, Battle Pass. The F2G1 Super Corsair is a really, really nice plane. For me, I think I'm going to be using this as my main Silver Lion grinder. This plane is absolutely phenomenal, and you get fairly constant results with this plane. It sits at battle rating 6.7, so you will see those up tiers. And you might think, well, 6.7 for a Corsair sounds a little bit harsh, but if you think about how much engine power this plane has, well, we're going to have a look at that in just a second. Loading up here into the hangar, we're going to go into X-ray mode and have a look at that absolute monster. 3,000 horsepower with four little rows of cylinders there in a uh, radial formation. 28 cylinders providing 3,053 horsepower at takeoff. This plane is probably the most powerful piston engine fighter in the whole game. Uh, and I, I say that with uh, a fair amount of uh, a fair amount of certainty. I don't know any other plane that has two double wasps, basically two double wasps sitting in line each, with each other, pumping out 3,000 horsepower. There is no other piston engine fighter that does it. There might be the Heinkel 177, uh, which has the two Dunlop Benz engines sort of uh, married to each other. Uh, and of course, you have a propeller-driven aircraft in the A2D1 which has, I think it's 5,100 uh, shaft horsepower. I'm not really sure how that differentiates, though. Anyway, onto the gameplay. The plane itself, I believe, is an F4UB Corsair with a little bit of upgrades. I'm not entirely sure about it, but it certainly looks and feels that way. The plane itself does fairly well at almost all speeds, except uh, basically above 600, uh, where it does start to compress. However, you still do have enough maneuverability and enough firepower to deal with things like a MiG-9 that isn't paying attention. Going up here into a vertical, I spot the Horton 229 and decide to continue on instead of storing that energy as altitude. Uh, and you can see that if you have opponents that are distracted, the uh, F2G1 makes short work of them with the 50 caliber machine guns. You do have 6 and you have I think 1400 rounds, so you do have a decent amount of ammunition, but you don't really have enough to sort of spray and pray, uh, especially with the current situation with the 50 caliber machine guns not being as uh, insane as they have been in previous patches. I would say they're fairly balanced at this point. You can very uh, solidly get w at least two kills if you are a piece of shit with uh, your aim, or uh, sorry, a potato with your aim like I am. Um, my aim in the with the 50 caliber machine guns is uh, pretty abysmal, as you will probably see in a couple of these uh, next couple of games. The F2G does suffer a little bit in a dive, like I mentioned, uh, getting that compression but if you work around it, it's not the end of the world, and it's certainly not uh, a death trap if you are not traveling vertically at like less than 200, 2,000 meters at 800 kilometers an hour. And speaking of 800 kilometers an hour, you will actually see that in this plane, especially in a dive, which means that you can keep up with planes like the uh, F-80A, you'll keep up with uh, Meteors, MiG-9s, Vampires, SK-60s, all that sort of stuff in a dive, which is extremely impressive for a proper type uh, aircraft. 6.7, 800 kilometers per hour. We're seeing like Dornier 335 level of, uh, of performance in a dive at this point. Now the the Dornier 335 comes with its own downsides. It's a very heavy, very uh, unmaneuverable and of course it doesn't take damage very well. Not only that but it can't defensive fly and the F2G1 can do basically all of those to some sort of degree. You don't want to be 
dogfighting certain jets and uh, some of the list of jets that you will sort of struggle to fight uh, will actually surprise you. The Meteor is one of those jets that you cannot outturn. It will sit behind you if they play their cards correctly. And I would, I would personally try and avoid getting below a Meteor at all, at all times possible. Anything with a swept wing, however, you're basically going to be able to sit behind all day long. Uh, F84Bs and F84Gs, you will be able to sit behind. There's no out, uh, or there's no sort of getting out turned by one of them unless you play your cards really, really badly. Uh, things like the SK60, you will have to watch out for. Uh, but things like the Kika, you'll be able to out turn. Barragon and Oregon, of course. Uh, and the J29s, you will not have a problem with. The 262s are also in the same basket. But um, I'm going to show you something sort of not to do. What I'm going to do here is the uh, 262 has shown some um, interest, if you will. Uh, and what I should have done here is I should have gone and changed my uh, angle of turn, which would have thrown the 262 off a little bit and uh, not have given me that sort of uh, death there. So moving on to this particular game here, we're up against a Yak-15 who is absolutely smashing up to altitude for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it look like I'm going to commit. I'm going to go down a little bit. We trade a, uh, a hit. And then I'm going to go into a vertical. What I'm doing here is I'm going to be storing my immense amount of speed as altitude. And you can see just how much altitude I put myself up over the Yak-15. But I can't quite roll myself in in time to get some really, really nice shots. I can, I can sort of try. Uh, and there I go. Just because the Yak-15 has stalled out a little bit and uh, tried to fight the uh, friendly plane that has come in. I've just only there managed to get some shots in, managed to get a uh, critical hit, and of course managed to get the engine smoking, which means that the uh, Yak-15 is not going to be in a good situation. Honestly, the Yak-15 from this point on is basically doomed, and so I turn my uh, attention to the Baragon here. Like we said in the first match, you can outturn a Baragon, and you can see here I'm going to go into a vertical to try and bait the Baragon into basically territory where he is definitely not going to be as better or as better as good as I am at turning now the Yak-15 goes for an ambitious vertical once more uh, kind of kind of risky if I decided to commit to that and just sort of blast my way uh, through but that's just too risky for me I don't want to put myself in that sort of danger when I don't have to so I'm going to avoid it and the Yak-15 is going to go and head back to base realizing that he is not going to get anything good out of me so the Oregon decides that he wants to sort of tag on to my friend, or my, my friendly rather, uh, and the F3D is not really having a great time. Unfortunately, he uh, sort of bugs off, well, unfortunately for, uh, for him, because that means he doesn't get himself a uh, fairly straightforward kill. This Baragon here is uh, realizing only now that I am behind him, and he turns instead of going in the straight line, but at this point in time, the Baragon has wasted so much of his energy that the... Uh, propeller driven aircraft are simply able to keep up. Props generally have a higher level of acceleration than jets. Uh, they also have slightly better energy retention in uh, climbs. Of course if you're afterburning it's a different story but in this particular case here the uh, the propeller driven aircraft will win uh, sort of 90% of the time and the only thing that you've really got as a jet is your speed. However you do have a fair amount of speed uh, and with that speed you can push up to altitude a lot better. The Baragon here has decided to waste all of that and suffers the consequence with an engine fire, resulting in, uh, in, in very sad times for this particular Frenchman. So, in this case here, I'm going to be putting myself into a climb. I need to recover some of that altitude that I've lost. Remember, props thrive off altitude and jets thrive off speed in a general sort of sense, uh, especially those that don't afterburn. You really need to keep your speed up in a uh, non-afterburning jet. And that's the thing that you sort of have to exploit as an F2G1, and you kind of can do that. Uh, obviously, there's no catching an F84 at 1,000 kilometers per hour, um, but if someone is turn fighting, it is very, very easy to come down and swoop in, take a kill, and then uh, come back up. The F2G really thrives in a, uh, in a sort of furball situation, or a situation where there is sort of no uh, escape for these jet fighters, where you can sort of dive on them with an energy advantage and then come out on top. Now, this particular Meteor gets sort of caught off guard. Uh, I managed to cut his uh, tail off, basically. He's got no uh, control surfaces. He's going to crash at some point, uh, and hopefully that's going to result in a kill. Uh, spoiler alert, it, uh, it it doesn't. Not because he makes it back to base, but because I get Gaijin. So that's pretty, pretty sad, honestly. 
But overall, you'll find that the F2G Corsair, or Super Corsair rather, is fairly powerful, uh, but not one of those machines that you're going to get ace games in every single game. For me, this plane provides some fairly consistent results, and that's what I like about it. Uh, I also like that it is a fairly methodical plane to fly. It's not something that you just go in and uh, play like an absolute ape and expect to do well in. It's something that you have to really think about when you play. You can't just sort of go in expect to do uh, absolutely nothing smart and then come away with an ace. You have to climb, you have to play your altitude properly, you have to boom and zoom in some circumstances, uh, and in other circumstances you will be put on the defensive. You obviously come up against props all the way down to battle rating 5.7, uh, because you will see things like the BF109 K4, and the K4 can uh, actually climb up to you with your altitude, uh, as well as being fairly formidable in a dogfight. Now, the K4 isn't exactly a dogfighting plane. It is very heavy, but if you are not careful with yourself, you will end up on the wrong side of the K4. Not only that, but you will come up against, uh, I think it's the, yeah, the Tau 152C and the Tau 152H, as well as, of course, the Doom Diver. Obviously, don't go head on with a Doom Diver. I think that's, you know, pretty standard. However, most of your opponents here will be Jets. Uh, the only exception, of course, is the Griffin Spitfire and... Uh, if you get a mixed match, probably the P51H. Um, for those particular planes, I would recommend climbing above them because the Griffin Spitfire, I don't know where it pulls energy out of, but my god, it just accelerates like you wouldn't believe uh, and kind of in some ways leaves the uh, Super Corsair in the dust. However, if you have a damaged engine like this A21RB, there's basically no escape. And in the case where you have damaged planes, having a, a Super Corsair to sort of swoop in and mop them up is extremely helpful and this is kind of what I'm going to do here uh, I'm pretty convinced that this A21RB isn't going to make it back to base anyway uh, and is probably going to crash and not give anyone the kill kind of like the Meteor did if you were paying attention to the kill feed so in this uh, we're looking at a fairly rapid closure distance you can see that the A21 has probably got no engine or very little engine power left uh, because it was beaten up by the AA and I managed to shear both of his wings off for a fairly easy kill now the last plane that we're going to be facing here is, I believe it's another J21, yeah, J21R, uh, which is the jet-powered version of the J21, so it's basically an A21 for air superiority, if you will. Now, this particular clip here displays the inability of the F2G1, which is, this is probably its biggest weakness, uh, and that, that is the armament. The, the guns on this particular plane are not strong. Uh, they're okay, they're fairly workable, they're fairly serviceable. Six Browning 50 cals with late war belts, uh, but they aren't the 20 mils that you'll see on things like the F4UB uh, or the, the F4U4B. Um, rather, it's it's one of those particular things where you just don't uh, you just don't have the the killing power with no gun time. So you basically need plenty of time to get your shells on target, uh, and that requires a little bit of use of your noggin, but that's not too bad, unless you're in a situation like this where I just want to kill this guy, I want to get the match over and done with, uh, and I don't want to have to deal with him camping the airfield. I think this match had like seven minutes left. Uh, if I were to go back or rearm and repair or anything like that, uh, I probably wouldn't have uh, gotten away with this kill, and I, I just wanted to end it. I didn't want to have any more bullshit. So I've done a couple of turns and notice how much energy I have bled uh, and that's because of those very hard turns rather than uh, sort of gentle turns or proper boom and zoom. I do manage to get the kill but uh, unfortunately due to a little bit of uh, greediness I get shot down by the AAA. But that's okay because this guy died first and because we had a ticket advantage um, which I had thought about before I had actually gone into this engagement. Uh, it turns out that we end up with a big fat juicy victory. So would I actually recommend taking the F2G1 into, uh, say, tank battles? No, uh, you have better, better cast planes there. Things like the AM1, the AD4, and of course the uh, P63. I highly recommend the P63 in general. Uh, but you can see this particular plane is an absolute beast at grinding. So if you are an RRB player, I would highly recommend that you absolutely use this plane. Anyway, ladies and gents, thank you very much for watching. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.